Hi, welcome to The Restaurant Show. I'm Justin Riley, your host. Stick around today because we've got some great food from some great local restaurants. We're gonna be joined by Dan from The Chocolate Caper and he's gonna be taking some viewer questions about what they do down there in Oregon. Plus, I had a chance to catch up with Chef Seamus Mullen over the phone and he's got some great ideas for cooking like a restaurateur in the comfort of your own home. Plus, our good friend Robert Bishop from Blown Smoke Barbecue is gonna demonstrate his beef brisket. It's all coming up right here on The Restaurant Show where we stop by the best restaurants in town so you can skip the rest and enjoy the best. We'll tell you where to eat coming up on The Restaurant Show. Welcome back to The Restaurant Show. I'm so excited to have our next guest with us because there's a little taste of Kansas City right here in Dane County. This is Robert Bishop from Blown Smoke Barbecue here in Wanakee, and we are on location. Thanks for having us here, Robert. Well, thanks for coming out. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to come up here. I mean, you know, whether, uh, you know, we film this obviously outside of normal business hours, but it always still smells so good in here all the time. Good, good. So we're, uh, we're excited about that. So what are, we, uh, what are we making today? We're gonna, this is a beef brisket. Okay. Uh, we're gonna trim this up. We use it for a few different things. Uh, this is the flat end. Okay. You can tell it's flat. This is called the point end. Okay. A lot fattier on the point end. Sure. More lean on the, on the. Uh... Sure, on the flat end. Yep. So we're gonna. Um... I'm gonna trim some fat out of here. So we're gonna kind of see this process from beginning. Start to finish. From yep. Start to finish. Okay. So tell us a little bit about brisket. I mean, what part of the, what part of the cow does that come from? This comes off the chest plate of okay. the cow. It's uh, very tough. Yeah. It's, it used to be considered just a crappy piece of meat really but then people figured out how to cook it and it's delicious okay and and uh kind of going off of that um we talked a little bit before the show started about pricing yep and at one point this used to be a very cheap cut of meat that you could get but that's not so anymore can you tell nope. us about how that's changed back in the day you used to get this 10 or 15 years ago back in kansas city 69.99 cents a pound wow now we're talking 250 almost three bucks a pound up here wow but uh, like I say, it's because everybody's figured out how to, to cook it proper, and uh, you know, of course, right. that's the way things go. Right, and it looks like you're cutting a lot of the fat off. Too, a lot of the so. fat off of the and point you're paying, end. And you're still paying $3 a pound for the fat. Exactly, <laughs> the, the, the uh, point end has a lot of fat in it, so you okay. don't really need much on the outside. Okay. The flat end, I'll leave that fat on there because it's, it's a little sure. leaner. Okay. That'll just kind of cook on through, keep it moist during the co uh, cooking process. Okay, cool, cool. So then you're gonna kind of are you cutting slices now? Is that kind of well? I'm just this is this is my flat end. I'll That's cook this. End, okay. I'll smoke this only for about six or seven hours. Okay. Because otherwise it'll start drying up a little bit. And you smoke all your own meat here. Oh yeah. Yep. And that's uh that's so all back, smoking. I'm assuming. Pardon? You you smoke that out back? Right here in the kitchen. Right yeah. here in the kitchen. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Heard of a lot of people having like so those uh, outdoor smoke houses, you know, that yep. people can get at their homes and stuff, but you do it right here in the kitchen. Yeah. Okay. So uh, talk to us a little bit about some of the catering that you do, because I know you do some catering. You've got a, you've got a, um, I don't know if it's a truck or a trailer that you, you have here. I have so. a vending cart that yeah. uh, I didn't actually get it out much last year. We're just short staffed and very busy. So busy here, that's a good yeah. problem to have, I we suppose. We do, uh, we've already about half booked for the summer for weddings. Wow. Uh, yeah, barbecue for weddings is great. We just, all the sauce on the side, so yeah. don't have to worry about too much of a mess. That's right. I remember that. that. That's something that you usually do is you like to have the sauce on the side. Yep. Which is yeah, I want cool. people to taste the uh, smoke flavor and the dry rubs. Sure, yeah. Now this part right here mm -hmm. is going to be burnt ends. Okay. See all that extra little fat in there? All right. And after about 14 hours, all that will cook out of there. Oh, really? Okay. Pretty much. And just, it'll just be juicy, extremely flavorful meat. Okay. And well, this, you uh, got my attention. So This we'll use for uh, beef dinner. Okay. All right. So we'll just rub her up here real quick. And can you tell us what's in the rub, Robert? Well, it's just a combination of spices, brown sugar, okay. you know, a little seasoned salt, uh, garlic powder, okay. various things. I was just kind of half teasing you. I didn't know right. if you wanted to give well, your secret I'll give out a few so. tips there. Okay. Give my All tips. Right. All right. And you've won some awards. I mean, this is all award-winning stuff. Can you talk yep. to us about some of the awards that you've won? Uh, well, we won some big contests. We won two grand championships. Okay. Which doesn't seem like much, but when you have to rely on 24 different people liking your food all in one day. Right. It's it's a it's a toughie. I bet. And it's yeah. just it, 24 people, 24 different judges. Is yeah, you'll get uh, six judges will try your ribs, six will try your pork, six will try your beef. Wow. But uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So we're kind of getting a taste of the process yeah. here, and so you yeah. just how long does that rub have to be on there? I marinated it for a day. A full day, and yep. then you smoke it after yep. the day. Wow. Okay. During competitions, they just give you uh, maybe 12 hours. Because you've got to be raw when you check in. Uh -huh. Then you can do your thing. 
So, but here at the restaurant, I like to go a little longer, you know. Sure, yeah. So you have to check in. You check yep. your raw meat in. They check it in, they weigh it, okay. they make sure everything's, it's a very well-run contest. It's, it's about as fair as you could ever get when sure. you're cooking food and all, you know, but. I bet, uh, I bet. yeah. So then we gotta, we're gonna put some rub on this now. And this, which one is for the burnt ends now? Uh, this one down here is for burnt ends. That's for the burnt ends. Yeah. Okay. It's, it just uh, cooks up perfect for that. Okay. And then what are we making with this? This will be for beef dinners. That's for beef dinners. Yep. We slice that a little thicker. Okay. Um, and it's got just enough fat in there to keep it sure. good and moist. Okay. Oh, all right. That is just. <laughs> The smell, I mean, you can't see, you can't smell it from out there, but it smells so good. This rub is just amazing, so. We do all this like uh, we would for competition, because mm -hmm. it's, once you've had the best, you just don't want to have anything less. Of course. So I treat it all the way I would if I was competing. Right, just and with a little bit more time. Right. A little, little bit more yeah, It TLC. doesn't take much, take, take much more time, and yeah. it's just so worth it. Yeah, I betcha, I betcha, okay. So what all comes with, uh, I mean, you have a, a variety of different sides that you can have. What yep. all comes with some of that? Uh, potato salad, we make all of them from scratch. Potato salad, coleslaw, mm -hmm. uh, baked beans, broccoli raisin salad. Okay. I'm going to so put gonna... together a sandwich here. Ooh, yeah. Sandwiches. <clears throat> and you just use, it uh, looks like you're using like Texas toast. Texas toast, yep. Okay. All right. And this is the beef. Okay after we've been smoked and sliced. Oh, right, all right. Yeah. And that's just how you cook it then. I mean, there's no further cooking process after nope. smoking. Nope, you smoke it, pull it out, let it cool a little bit, slice yeah. her up. Yeah. And it just, it just falls apart. I mean, you know, we talked a little tender, bit, juicy. We talked a little bit before the show about how uh, there's people who are kind of smoking their own meats at home, like you can buy these little smoke houses. Right. Is there any recommendation? Because there's a certain kind of wood that you want to buy, like wood chips that you want to buy to smoke. I mean, what? Can well, you I use a variation. Back? I use uh, like pecan for the ribs. Okay. Uh, oak for the beef. Okay. Pork. Apple on our prime rib. Apple on our bacon. Okay. Um, wow. Yeah. All that stuff makes a difference. That's just so amazing to me. Most of our sandwiches come with kettle chips okay. and a pickle. All right. Uh, you can upgrade to any of our homemade sides. Very cool. And there's a delicious beef sandwich. There it is, right there. Well, as soon as we go to commercial break, I'm going to be chowing down on this. So if you would like to chow down on something just as good, come on up to Blown Smoke Barbecue here in Wanakee. Hey, thanks for having us today, Thank Rob. you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Don't go away. There's more restaurant show coming up right after the break, so stick around. Coming up next on The Restaurant Show, I caught up with Chef Seamus Mullen. This celebrity interview is sponsored by Fuegos Steak Tapas Vegan. And welcome back to The Restaurant Show. Today we are joined by award-winning chef and restaurateur, Chef Seamus Mullen, who is here to share his tips and tricks for creating restaurant quality recipes home at home at any night of the week. Well, how are you there, Chef? I'm doing well, how are you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. So, you know, a lot of folks, they like to eat out because, you know, they enjoy uh, trying new foods and they enjoy having foods prepared for them, but, you know, that can get to be kind of a cost for some folks. And so, is there a way that people can have uh, restaurant quality food uh, at home any night of the week. And what are your tips for that? Sure. All you got to do is win the lottery and get a private chef to come over and cook for you all the time. Oh, well, you're hired then. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's really not as difficult as you might think. Um, you know, a few simple tricks and tips and you'll be cooking at home just like a professional chef in no time. You know, one of the things that I love to, to always remind folks is that it's super important to start with the best quality ingredients you can. You can't make good, good food with bad ingredients. You got to start with the best stuff. And I'm a big fan of pork. I cook a lot of pork in my restaurants for a variety of reasons. I mean, one, it's, it's super flavorful. People love it. But it's also a really healthy, uh, healthy choice for, um, for, for healthy fats and healthy proteins. It's super versatile. A lot of things you can do with it. My go-to pork is Smithfield Prime. It's uh, super, super juicy and, and delicious. And it's just a great way to build a whole meal. So if you start with a really good ingredient, and then you can kind of riff on that, and you can improv. You know, I always say, tell people, don't get too hung up on a recipe. A recipe is a good place to, to start, but then just you know work with what you have. If you don't have all the ingredients in the recipe or if you don't like a certain ingredient that's in the recipe, you can feel free to kind of improv and to put your own personality into a dish. 
That's good to know because a lot of people are good at following recipes, but they have they sort of lack the courage to try something yeah. new and to put their own flavor. They get hung up it. like, oh, I don't have cinnamon. What can I got to I got to throw this out. I can't do the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, it's important. Just don't don't be totally didactic about it. You can just play around with what you have in the uh, in in the pantry and and use your own you know use your own creativity. Absolutely. So, uh, what recipes have you brought with you today? So I've got a bunch of different recipes that I that, uh, put together today using all different cuts of pork. I, as I said, I love using pork, so I've got, I want to highlight all the different cuts of the pork. Um, we have uh, some pork chops. Now these are a maple and mustard glazed pork chop. They're roasted with braised mushrooms. Mushrooms and pork go really well together, and then having that um, mustard gives a little spiciness, and then the sweetness of the ma maple kind of mellows that out. It's a really nice balance. Um, I also have a spice-crusted pork tenderloin. Tenderloin is the leanest cut of, of pork, um, so you want to be really gentle when you cook it. You don't want to overcook it because it'll get really dry. And remember, it's fine for it to be a little bit pink in the middle with a pork tenderloin. Um, that means that it's really uh, it's, it's nice and juicy and moist. So this pork tenderloin is with um, some spaghetti squash, raisins, and pine nuts, which gives it a really nice sort of sweet and sour thing going on. It's a, it's a great uh, simple dish to make. And then uh, I have some Brussels sprouts. I don't know about you, but I love Brussels sprouts. I can't get enough of them. And Brussels sprouts and pork are a match made in heaven. So those are por some pork belly. And instead of using bacon, I'm using fresh pork belly with the Brussels sprouts. And that's going to be a little rich, so I want to cut that with something uh, uh, that will kind of lean it out a little bit. And so I have um, some pomegranate seeds, which has got some sweetness and also a little bit of acidity. And then the, uh, the jalapenos. So that's a good trick. If you're doing something that's kind of rich, you want to use something that'll, that's kind of sharp to slice through that richness. So that could be acid or it could be a little bit of spice. But right now, it's uh, the height of the summer. To me, it's all about grilling, and it's all about tomatoes, and it's all about bountiful produce. So these are some pork steaks that have been grilled with a little bit of tomato and olive relish. I've got fresh herbs in there as well, and then some summer greens. Super simple, but really captures the flavors of summer. Wow, you sure you can't fly out to Madison real quick and just uh, bring some of that over to us here at the station? That'd be uh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I'll just jump on a plane in just a few minutes. And see okay, what I can we'll do. see in a bit. Um, so uh, obviously, we know you as a chef and restaurateur. Uh, how do you come up with new dish ideas for your restaurants? So you know, we always start with a principal ingredient. So if it's a protein. You know, as we're talking about pork right now, it could be a, a cut of pork. And then we think about what's the best way to cook it. If you've got, uh, say, pork tenderloin, for instance, which I mentioned before is really tender, but doesn't have um, much fat and it's super lean. If you were to roast that in the oven at high temperature or for a long period of time, it's just not going to do well at all. So we like to think of what's the best way to cook it. Uh, in the case of pork tenderloin, pan roasting it or lightly grilling it is a great way of doing it. So we start by thinking about what is the best application for that, for that um, particular protein. And then we want to really accentuate that. And uh, to me, the best way to get ideas around produce to go along with it is to go to the farmer's market and see what's in season. Talk to the farmers, get a sense as to what is best. If you've got a local farmer's market, I guarantee you if you go and talk to them, they'll be, they'll be super proud of whatever their best product is. So if it's, um, you know, I know you guys in the Midwest, you've got great corn, you've got uh, cherries coming in pretty soon, and peaches, and a lot of great orchards. So that's the kind of stuff that I'm, you go to the farmer's market, the farm stand, you talk to your local producer, they're going to tell you what's best. And then you'll learn a little bit about what's going on in your area. And, uh, and it's great to cook seasonally and locally as much as possible. That's when things are going to taste the best. It's also when they're going to be the most nu nutritious. And then a simple trick to kind of make things really take them to another level is to use fresh herbs. Um, you know, people tend to buy, maybe they'll buy a clamshell of fresh herbs at home or at, at the supermarket and they won't use them again. So what I like to do is I like to have little potted plants of fresh herbs that I'm growing in the kitchen and just snip off a little bit throwing it in at the very end, and that adds a really bright vibrancy to the dish. I think it was uh, Julia Child who said, you don't need to cook fancy recipes, just good food with fresh ingredients. And, and that lots of love. That, yeah, and lots of love, and that love. definitely yep. speaks to that for sure. So totally uh, real quick before we go, Seamus, where can we go for more information about all these great recipes? You can get all of these recipes that I put together if you go to smithfield.com slash primechefs, and you can get a complete list of all the Prime Chef partners with tons of other recipes and lots of cooking ideas to, to make these restaurant quality dishes at home and see that it's not nearly as difficult as it might seem. All right, the one and only chef, Seamus Mullen, thank you so much for being with us here today on The thank Restaurant you. Show. Thank you, thanks for having me. And there's more to come on The Restaurant Show, so stick with us.
This celebrity interview was sponsored by Fuegos, steak, tapas, vegan. Coming up next on The Restaurant Show, Dan from The Chocolate Caper takes viewer questions from Facebook. It's up next. Welcome back to The Restaurant Show. As promised, we're talking chocolate. And one of my favorite topics, of course, right? We love dessert. This is Dan Donahue, the owner of Chocolate Caper in Oregon. Nice to see you. Good to see you. And I'm talking Oregon, Wisconsin, just in case there's any questions, just down the street. Um, we're doing a fun thing today. I'm very excited. Back in the day, right, we used to have a big mailbag and we'd answer letters. People don't yeah. send letters anymore, right? Very rarely. It's more Facebook messages is yes. how we tend to get them. So today we're answering your questions that you wanted asked on TV for Dan. Your chocolate questions answered here today. Now this is one that I have myself. First one from John is, what is a praline versus a praline? And if you don't know, listen up. No, the spelling is almost identical. The spelling is identical except for the accent on praline right. to make to give it that French little note sure. to it. Yes. Um, and a praline is basically any sugared nut. Okay. Um, any combination of a sugar and nut. And what happened is in Europe, before chocolate made it there from the New World, most of the candy was candied nuts. Uh -huh. So they would either boil nuts in candy or bake them covered in sugar. Okay. Um, and if they took that, the finished product and ground it up, the ground product was called praline with no E. Okay. Uh, and then the praline, uh, when chocolate did make it from the New World, they stirred chocolate into it and we got praline. So uh -huh. praline often refers to any mixture of a nut and chocolate. Okay, I see. All things I didn't know. This bring, brings us back into some history. Now, if you don't know, what is a truffle? What makes a truffle So a truffle? comparatively, a truffle is, at its most basic, anything with a soft center and a hard shell. Okay. Um, so you can have hundreds of different flavors of truffle, and there are hundreds of different flavors of truffle. Sure. Everything from chili pepper truffles to your traditional raspberry or lemons or fruit so flavors. So it's more about like the com composition of the chocolate. Exactly. Or of the candy. Chocolate though, usually, right? Well, yep, the center is going to be usually be a ganache, so uh -huh. a cream and chocolate with sure. together um, with any number of flavorings that yeah. you can add in. I think you're getting more questions as we speak. You probably can't they're, hear Dan's phone going in. off. <laughs> um, so, like these are examples of truffles. Yes. We have a blood orange truffle, okay. a white, pure white chocolate truffle, mm -hmm. a passion fruit truffle, and an almond truffle. Wow, that really is a So you're welcome variety. to try any of those that you like. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I don't know which one. What's this one? This is the that's one that pure white chocolate. Pure white chocolate. Okay. I'll give that one a go. While I'm doing that, talk to us about what is tempering chocolate. That's another question I got on, on right, Facebook. So tempering chocolate, um, chocolate before it's mm -hmm. tempered has these things called beta crystals in it. And they're sort of scattered all over, they're not uniform. And what it results in is your chocolate being matte, not having a good shine to it. It crumbles instead of breaking. Oh, I see. And it affects the consistency and the appearance of the chocolate. Mm -hmm. So tempering is a process where you heat the chocolate and mm -hmm. then cool it and then heat it and cool it repeatedly while stirring it or agitating it. Okay. And you cause the crystals, they're getting really scientific. There's six different types of crystals and you want one specific type. So mm -hmm. by doing that, you get that one specific type to form and then you um, keep it going and they form into, into sort of uniform lines. Okay. And that's what gives chocolate its gloss, makes it snap break um, cleanly. So if I take one of these and try mm -hmm. to break it, it doesn't crumble, it just snaps oh, wow. right in half. You're like a chocolate chemist. Well, it, there's a lot of chemistry that goes into chocolate. Yeah. It's very similar to baking in that it's as much chemistry and science as it is art. No kidding. So. Wow, I'm learning a lot today. Okay, I want to get to Kate's question. On which holiday do you sell the most chocolate? I feel like I know the answer, but I'll let uh, you, I'll see if I'm right. A lot of people think Valentine's Day. That was my answer. Okay, what? So and Valentine's wrong. Day is a close second. All right. Um, we do the most chocolate on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, really? Largely because people are sending gifts to family and sure. um, gifts to work co-workers and businesses yeah. are sending out gifts to clients and employees and I things suppose. like that. Thanksgiving, so, so do you do, but, what do you give someone on Thanksgiving? But Thanksgiving, a lot of times it's hostess gifts oh, um, that makes and sense. different things of that nature. I so had people a, are picking a up a box vision there. of like this turkey, chocolate turkey centerpiece. That's, <laughs> That's an idea that we could do in the future. Maybe. Well, See, we'll make I'm giant hired. chocolate turkeys. That'd be cool. Yeah, it? Especially if you could carve them. Yeah, Just like for a, a good vegetarian off. holiday, maybe? Exactly. Um, okay, so I was wrong. Chocolate and, or chocolate. Christmas and Thanksgiving, not Valentine's Day. And then Valentine's Day is a very close second. Okay, so runner-up is Valentine's Day. 
Uh, okay, so here's a good question from Amanda C. Talking about allergies, so a lot of people out there have peanut allergies, as you know. Is there any s chocolate safe for someone with a peanut allergy? You're probably making things in the same vicinity. Is that the concern? Yeah, at, uh, most candy shops deal with a lot of nuts. That's yeah. just the nature of candy is sure. to have nuts in it. So. Um, for us, we do offer a number of options that are free of different allergens. Okay. So all of our almost almost all of our chocolate is gluten free. Oh wow! Um, very little is dairy free. It's hard to make chocolate without dairy. Right. Um, but and then in terms of nuts, it depends on the candy. So like this truffle has almond in it. Mm -hmm. So we're certainly not going to want to give that to someone with an al almond or, uh, allergy. Yeah. Peanuts, hazelnuts are the most common ones we use, peanuts, almonds, and hazelnuts. Right. And we do take steps to prevent cross-contamination. We cover sure. the bowls with wet towels so nothing can get out. We sanitize all our equipment between making batches. But we always tell them, if you come in with a severe allergy yeah. to nuts, we're very weary of yeah. Of trying anything just because we don't want to risk the chance of an allergic right. reaction. Um, but if it's not a, a super severe um, allergy, then we're very comfortable mm -hmm. with. Yes. We have caramels, toffees, dipped apricots, fruits, gels, um, pure chocolate. So any number of things that would work perfectly fine for so someone you with keep an allergy. It pretty separate. Okay. Uh, I want to ask the next question. We only have about a minute left, so I'm going to sneak it in. Why is white chocolate white, and is it real chocolate? That is a great question because many places use what they call white chocolate, but mm -hmm. it's not really white chocolate. It's almond bark, which is basically cream, vanilla, and sugar. Um, real white chocolate does exist, and what happens is when you break open a cocoa bean, the beans are actually white. And as you process them, you separate it into cocoa butter mm -hmm. and uh, cocoa solids. Cocoa butter is white. Cocoa solids are what give chocolate the color. And the amount of those solids that you mix into the cocoa butter determine what percentage the chocolate is. So if it's milk chocolate or 70, 80, 90 percent dark, um, those are all just the ratio of milk uh, of cocoa butter to the cocoa solids. Wow. So white chocolate only has cocoa butter in it with none of the cocoa solids. That might have been my favorite question and answer right there. I just learned so much from you all this whole time. This is great. Well, we're going to have you back, as you know, and maybe we'll have more questions for you. So if you got any questions, reach out to these folks at the Chocolate Caper. And uh, if you have a sweet tooth, definitely reach out to these folks at the Absolutely. Chocolate Caper. We'll be back with more Restaurant Show coming up right after the break. Thanks so much for joining me here today on The Restaurant Show. I hope that when you're out and about looking for a place to eat or at the local grocery store, you'll consider any one of these fantastic locally owned businesses. That's all the time we have for today on The Restaurant Show. This is Justin Riley reminding you that life is too short to eat average. We'll see you next time.